stand with us today?
ask that your will would be done this morning, that you would change us, you make us more like you, God. We just want to be part of what you're doing here, and we're so thankful, God. Bless this time together. You are where it all begins. 
Sin was great, your love was greater. 
proclaim your greatness this morning. Thank you so much, worship team, for leading us this morning. And good morning, everybody. It is so good to see your faces or the camera screen. That works, too. Uh, but it's so good to see you this Sunday morning. We are so glad that you have connected in with us today. And if this is your first Sunday, an extra big warm welcome to you. And we are so glad that you've joined us. And if you are new or maybe you've been around for a bit but you've never filled out the connection card, there's a QR code on your screen. Fill that out. Just give us a chance to get to know you. We just want to call, see how your experience was. Maybe we'll get you to like rate our pastors of like your favorite to least favorite if you sign up. Could be fun. So definitely fill that out if you haven't before. As well as next Sunday, we are doing ice cream sandwiches once again after service. We did that on July 11th and it went really good because we ate ice cream. So we liked it so much that we're going to do it again. So please join us next Sunday after for some ice cream sandwiches just out in the parking lot. Uh, there is some really exciting news about our facility expansion campaign. So if you want to find out more about that, go to eaglemont.church, scroll all the way to the bottom and click on the faith expansion button. And on there, there is um, an FECC newsletter and a bunch of really exciting information about the progress of how that's going and what the next steps are and how those are being taken by our building expansion lead team uh, and everything like that. So please keep praying with us for that, that God just really leads us in how to proceed with that. But be sure to check that out because there's some really cool and exciting information there. Um, there is a Christmas initiative. I know it's August 1st, but... It's never too early to talk about Christmas. So there is a Christmas initiative happening by Teach Them, which is a ministry of John and Flora DeHere, who are people uh, within our church body. Um, and they're teaming up with Mars Hill Urban Mission Society. And so they're seeking uh, partners to help fund the distribution of an educational resource uh, to a bunch of kids uh, about the Christmas story in their own native language throughout Ghana. So... Uh, it's a really awesome initiative. It's something that's really cool to get involved in. If you're looking for a way to be uh, missional, this is a really cool opportunity for that. So the books will be given to the kids in December, and the hope and prayer is that they learn the story of Jesus and they get to know him on a personal level. So donations can be e-transferred to david at mhums. I'm hoping that's on the screen so that I don't get it wrong. If not, email me and I'll give you the correct one, uh, but they could be email transferred there um, or they could be given to John and Flora when they're in on a Sunday morning as well. So anything over $30 is tax deductible and you can sponsor 10 children for $60 or a whole school or youth ministry club for $600. So a really cool way to just get involved there. One more exciting thing. Look at all the exciting things that happen on Sunday morning. Aren't you glad you came? We have Peyton, who is our summer intern with us today. So Peyton, can you stand so everybody can see your face? This is Peyton. She is interning with us uh, this summer until November. She is doing um, half with youth, half with children's ministry. So if something goes wrong, blame it on her so that we all get a break. So that is who you go to see with all questions, concerns, and problems that are too hard for me to deal with, but we are uh, just so glad that, that Brendan is going to be speaking today, and we're going to join in that now, but as always, for all information, eaglemont.info, and follow us on all of our social media channels. Awesome. Thanks, Jaden. Sorry, I'm just going to move this. Um, so you might have noticed that uh, it's <laughs> any pastor you see have, has just been me and Jaden today. Uh, Joel's on vacation, and then um, <laughs> last night... Well, Pastor Marlow, who's also my dad, was stung on both legs from wasp, and he's very allergic. So he's recovering, and he can't walk. So it's actually like, it's rough. But now that uh, I'm in charge, um, I'll be, my sermon, I'll be changing my sermon to actually um, my sermon on why turkey is bad and shouldn't be the Christmas and Thanksgiving meal. Anybody with me? Woo! <laughs> That's very divisive, by the way. Put that up, put that opinion up on Instagram. Got a lot of hate. Um, okay, no, I'll be uh, talking about the Beatitudes. We are in um, the Beatitude series for this summer, so that's Matthew chapter 5. Um, so if you want to open up your Bibles or follow along on the screen, we're going to jump into Matthew chapter 5. Okay, so this series is called the Beatitudes because um, that comes from the Latin word beatus, which means to be blessed. And here all eight sayings of Jesus that we'll be studying are, you know, blessed are the 
blank. Or if you grew up in church, probably blessed are the blank, which I don't know why we say it that way. Blessed. Um, we were walking through the eight sayings of Jesus this summer. So if you're completely new to Christianity, you know, here, online or here in church, uh, Jesus was a historical man 2,000 years ago that we believe also was completely God. He came down to earth to show us how to live, and then he um, took the punishment of sin and death in our place, and then rose again uh, to defeat sin and death and give us a relationship with Jesus. So that's the core of what we believe, very summed up very quickly. Um, so we pick up Jesus' story in uh, chapter 5 of Matthew, and Jesus is speaking to a crowd. So um, chapter 5 and the Beatitudes actually introduced, uh, you might have heard of the Sermon on the Mount. So the Sermon on the Mount is um, this larger part of Jesus' teaching that is written in chapters 5, 6, and 7. So you can read the full Sermon on the Mount uh, on your own. It's wonderful, a few chapters of Jesus' um, teaching. But right now, we're just going to read through the Beatitudes, so like just the start of the Sermon on the Mount. Um, I'll just quickly point out uh, um, something that, you know, blessed is kind of a weird word, right? Like, but it, it can also be translated to, you know, it's, it, we're, English translations are always trying to do their best to bring out the original language into our language, and it's a historical language, so it's very difficult sometimes. But blessed can be also, like, um, it can be translated to happy sometimes, but it's more of this deep happiness, this deep joy, um, more than just a general kind of, oh, I'm happy today. Um, this is like true happiness, which can, which can be found in God. So starting in verse 1 of Matthew chapter 5 in the NIV translation, you can read along with me. It says, Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him, and he began to teach them. He said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Okay, so my verse that I've been given to focus on is verse 6. So I'll just read that again. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Uh, some translations say, for they will be satisfied, which I think kind of gives a little bit of a better image. But, okay, there's the verse. So, what's going on here? You know, it's pretty straightforward. It seems pretty straightforward. How am I going to talk about this for half an hour? Well, thank you for asking. Uh, first of all, let me discuss a few things about this verse shortly that, you know, definitely could have dove deeper into, could have been their own sermons, but... Um, I just felt pulled to talk about some other stuff. So we'll just give a few little quick ideas of what this, what this is about. So first of all, um, when we read hunger and thirst for righteousness, Jesus was using an extreme verb here. So we, so we should actually kind of be more thinking like starvation and dehydration. Uh, something that most of the ancient world probably would have been more familiar with than we today. Um, but Jesus is, is saying you know, this extreme example, he's saying, he's not just saying, you know, those who desire righteousness. He's saying, blessed are those who need righteousness like so bad that they feel they're going to die without it. So it, it's meant to be this extreme image of, you know, a passion for God and a passion for righteousness, which I hope we can all grow in. But again, that's another sermon. So next little point is, um, I don't want to point out, Jesus doesn't say blessed are those who are righteous, right? Instead, it's blessed are those who you know, want righteousness, who strive for righteousness. Uh, in one sense, this was probably pointing out the flaws of the religious teachers at the time, the Pharisees, who were very self-righteous and looked down on others. And then uh, on the other hand, it's also saying, you know, we must strive for righteousness always. Um, be hungry and thirsty for it. And, it, you know, it's one of those things that we'll never reach because we can never be perfect like Jesus, but we can always be more like Jesus every day. So it's this lifelong struggle and battle to strive for righteousness. Okay, and the last quick little thing is that uh, when Jesus says, for they will be satisfied or for they will be filled in the NIV translation, he's saying like only those who hunger and thirst for righteousness will be satisfied. Being more like Jesus 
is the only thing that brings you true satisfaction in life. You know, if you're hungry and thirsty for worldly things, for more power, money, every worldly pleasure, it'll just leave you empty, and you're always wanting more and more, and you're never satisfied. But those who chase after righteousness will be satisfied. That's the promise of Jesus, because God gives you all that you need. Okay, so there are the three little mini-sermons. Now for the main ideas we're going to jump into. So let's just start with a general understanding of the Beatitudes, of all these blessed are the fill in the blank. So they kind of have a, a dual purpose, I think. They are kind of saying, you know, here's some direction of how to live in the kingdom of God, um, you know, how you should be growing. And at the same time, they're also saying, these are the type of people, you know, these pe- the people that are like this already, that will be at the forefront of Jesus' kingdom. You know, many Bible scholars call Jesus' kingdom, they refer to it as his upside down kingdom. Okay, because his teaching just goes against all the cultural norms and human ideas of, you know, who should be the first in the kingdom? Who should be the leaders? We think the powerful, you know, the great, the good-looking, the rich, but Jesus, Jesus' kingdom isn't like that. In the upside-down kingdom, it's the, the mournful that find blessing. It's the people that have been persecuted. It is the, the meek that will inherit the kingdom. It's the oppressed, the orphans, the widows, and the marginalized who are first in Jesus' kingdom. It is those who desire to be righteous who are blessed and first in the kingdom, not the ones that seem to have it all together, which is a blessing for us. We don't have to have it all together. We don't have to pretend to have it all together. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. So uh, Jesus says twice in the Beatitudes, uh, the kingdom of heaven, and and I kind of want to park on this idea for a little bit, because I think it's important. Um, So we're going to talk about kingdom, and we're going to talk about heaven, and how those relate. So Jesus uses the phrase kingdom of heaven, or uh, kingdom of God, like so much in his teaching. If you actually like look for it, it's everywhere. It's probably the thing he talks about the most. Uh, So we need to understand this in the original context. How would the Jewish people at the time, who were historically, you know, God's chosen people, how would they have understood what Jesus was saying? Okay, so when Jesus said kingdom, everyone in the time would have thought physical kingdom. Like, we're going to get a new king and we're going to be our own nation. Okay, that's not what Jesus ended up meaning. Um, But that's what everyone would have been thinking about. They were, you know, they were a nation, the Jewish people, were a nation living under the occupation of Rome. uh, And before that, they were exiled and and in Babylon. And it's been hundreds and hundreds of years Uh, since they've been independent and a nation of their own and had their own kingdom. And it's been a thousand years since David was king, who they view as like just, you know, the last great king and also the first great king. It's that golden era that everyone is like nostalgic for in a way. And, um, you know, over this time as they were were taken over by one nation and then another and living in exile, it, it was being prophesied over and over that this savior would come, that this Messiah would save them and create a new kingdom for them. And, you know, like they used to have. So Jewish people immediately would have thought, oh, sweet, Jesus is going to bring a new kingdom. That's why they, a couple times, people like picked him up and tried to make him king. Like, and then he just sort of says he just like slipped away, which I'd love to see what that looked like. Just like ducks behind someone. (laughs) Where'd he he go? (laughs) Um, but, But yeah, that's what's going on. And then and then Jesus dies. Okay, and then everyone's like, well, there, there goes that idea. And even his disciples, like, within those three days of Jesus dying and being resurrected, they go back to their old jobs, probably thinking, there's three years of my life I'm not getting back. What, like, that was useless. But then he, rose back from, then he rose from the dead, and the pieces started coming together that this wasn't just about one nation. This wasn't just about a physical nation, a physical king. This was bigger. Jesus was creating a spiritual kingdom. Sometimes I just feel like, you know, it's so easy to read these things like kingdom of God, kingdom of heaven, not really think through them. Okay, why is he saying that? Why is this here? Why is Jesus using it? Okay, Um, but, you know, let's keep moving. So kingdom, I think we kind of got that. It's a, you know, it's a good metaphor. It's a place where king reigns and has a people group under him, and Jesus was starting a spiritual kingdom. Okay, so now I want us to uh, understand heaven a, a a little differently. So a biblical dictionary describes heaven this way. It says, heaven is the term used in the Bible to indicate the space where God and various spiritual beings reside. 
it is also used to speak of the area above the earth, the sky. You know, sometimes biblical authors will uh, use heaven or heavens to just describe what's above, you know, the, the air, the sky, the space. Uh, and sometimes they say they're kind of describing space and God's space in like at the same time by saying heaven. So there's a couple different meanings. That, uh, you just kind of need to understand the context of when they're saying it. But uh, the main use is that first sentence in the definition. Heaven is the term used in the Bible to indicate the space where God and various spiritual beings reside. Okay, heaven is the space where God resides. Earth is the space where we reside. That's right here, in case you're confused. The world where we reside. That's pretty straightforward. Now, probably you already know that part, but there's, there's, there's a little shift um, that needs to happen in, in our thinking, I think. We view heaven as a place where God is, okay? When, it, when in fact, how it's used in the Bible is actually heaven is anywhere that God resides. Heaven is the place where God resides, which isn't just limited to heaven, isn't just limited to this other world. It, you know, heaven can be also here on earth where God resides. That's how the biblical authors are using heaven sometimes. Okay, so we'll kind of come back to that because there's another shift <clears throat> in our thinking. You know, what, what we normally do wrong, I think, um, is we think heaven as only the place where we go when we die, right? Someone says heaven, you're thinking, I'll get there one day, um, hopefully. But that is not the main use in the Bible, actually. And you'd be surprised how, how little the Bible talks about heaven as just the afterlife. The focus of heaven is not later, after death, but the focus of heaven in the Bible is right now. God's space right now. It is a spiritual reality that, that is at work and has significance for the present moment. That is how it would have been understood in the original context. And there were places where God's space and our space were one, you know, overlapping. That was what was happening in the Garden of Eden. There's this perfect overlap and unity of heaven and earth, God's space and our space, one. And then, um, and then the Old Testament, like, temples, that was meant to be part of that reality. That was meant for the same purpose, that overlap of heaven and earth, um, of God's spiritual reality and our physical reality being together. Okay, and now Jesus has come to earth to advance that kingdom. So he talks about the kingdom of heaven because he wants to advance that kingdom on earth, God's space on earth. Um, I love, uh, there's a Bible project video about heaven and earth, and, and they put it this way, and I just love it. Um, they say that, you know, Jesus was going around creating little pockets of heaven wherever he went, you know, healing people, bringing people that were outcast into the community, creating this heaven here on earth, bringing heaven and earth together. Okay, I mentioned earlier that uh, the Sermon on the Mount is this big sermon from Jesus, and it starts with the Beatitudes. Um, and then the Beatitudes are actually like bookended with this phrase, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. It's part of the first Beatitude in verse 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And it's part of the last Beatitude in verse 10. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So in ancient literature, uh, repetition is like the main way to bring focus. If you see the Bible repeating something, maybe just stop and try and understand what it's saying. And because Jesus also used this phrase at the beginning and at the end of the Beatitudes, we can understand that um, he's actually kind of surrounding all the Beatitudes in this theme of the kingdom of heaven. So in, so in a sense, all the Beatitudes are about the kingdom of heaven. They also have their own little specific meaning, like we've been talking about in each sermon. But at the same time, they are all a part of this kingdom of heaven theme. Jesus is telling people how they should live in the kingdom of heaven. You know, who will be exalted? Who will be the first in his kingdom? Okay, so he's talking about the kingdom of heaven. And then in the next chapter, also part of the Sermon on the Mount is the Lord's Prayer. Very famous prayer. It's where Jesus teaches us how to pray. And what does he say about God's kingdom? About the kingdom of heaven? He prays, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Just one chapter later, he's praying that. Heaven is meant to be understood as where God is, his space, where he resides. And the main idea of heaven in the Bible is to be focused on heaven coming to earth, invading and changing our lives, changing our families, our world. We shouldn't think of heaven, as, um, heaven and earth as two actually distinct places. 
you know, we're here and then, then we'll go to heaven one day. But actually, instead, it's almost like two dimensions that overlap, that overlap and come together. What we experience as the physical world and then what we experience as the spiritual reality of God's space that can overlap and be one here and now. So, of course, yes, there is, there is hope after death where we'll be um, in heaven, in God's space forever, and that'll be amazing. But most of the time when the Bible uses heaven, we're meant to think, okay, how does this apply to me right now? What is Jesus saying for right now? It, it isn't talking about later. It's talking about how wonderful it is to be in the kingdom of heaven now, in God's presence now. So right now, in this moment, we are a part of the kingdom of heaven. We are in the kingdom of heaven. Not the church building, but we who are the people that have relationships with Jesus, the Christ followers. You know, if you are a Christ follower, you have stepped into the spiritual kingdom of heaven. So we are part of this upside-down kingdom of God, and we should be praying, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Our focus shouldn't be, you know, I just can't wait to get to heaven and leave this world behind, although that, that will be nice. But the heart of Jesus is to see heaven come down to earth. God is just in the the business of redemption and healing, and he wants to bring heaven to this world. Okay, so let's just work through that in our minds a little bit. Let's take a deep breath. Maybe let that soak in, because uh, this took me a while to kind of work through it, because for, you know, my whole life, and maybe a lot of of you, growing up in church, every mention of heaven was just the place you go where, where you die. But then we'll miss what Jesus is saying now, we'll miss what the biblical authors are saying. We need to understand heaven as God's space that is at work in our lives right now. Okay, so I'm talking about this kingdom of heaven, which maybe doesn't seem to apply to mine, but um, I think it's important to understand the Beatitudes as a whole before we can really understand the one. And they do tie together. Um, So I'll just read my verse again. So stick with me. It all will hopefully come together in the end. So My verse is, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Okay, so what's righteousness? Um, It's kind of one of those things where it's like, I think we all know we know what it is, but at the same time, it's kind of confusing to me to uh, describe, because it's actually not just like being holy or being good. And uh, it's sort of this older word that we don't use in today's world too much, other than people being like self-righteous. So you know, unfortunately has a more negative connotation. Um, and when I was researching it, I was like, oh, but this is hard to understand because also in the original language, it's tied to like God's justice when talking about how God is righteous. So we'll talk about that more later, but there's more to this word than just one English word can explain, which happens a lot. You know, again, biblical translation from an old language to a new one, it can be difficult. But let's look at righteousness uh, in the way that the Old Testament theologian, Gerhard, uh, Gerhard von Rod, talks about, he says this. He says, there is absolutely no concept in the Bible with so central a significance, or, yeah, so central a significance for all, relations, for all relationships of human life as that of righteousness. It is the standard not only for our relationship to God, but also for our relationship with fellow human beings. Indeed, it is even the standard of our relationship to animals and relationship to our natural environment. Okay, so what we should understand is that righteousness isn't just this this weird religious word or this weird religion thing. Um, Righteousness just means, it can be simplified just to mean to live up to to particular demands that a relationship places on us. Okay, righteousness is about living in faithfulness to a relationship. Uh, Dr. Daryl Johnson, uh, he's a professor and author out of Vancouver. I've seen him speak a couple times. He just seems like the nicest older man, Uh, so I really like him. Um, He he talks about this in one of his sermons. He's talking about righteousness and how it's related to relationships. He says, just to kind of understand in our context, like he says, a spouse is righteous who lives up to the terms of the marriage covenant. A citizen is righteous who lives up to the expectations of the civil order. Righteousness, therefore, can mean right relationship or in right relation to someone. Okay, so then the Bible tells us how to be righteous. If if righteousness is living in right relation to God, then the Bible explains how to have that right relationship with God, which is just a beautiful gift and something we should not um, take for granted. 
we should always be appreciated. We should always appreciate that God has given us this book, the Bible, so that we can learn how to be in right relationship with him. Okay, now I want to be clear. Righteousness is not something that we can earn or be good enough to earn a relationship with God. That's only done through Jesus. Um, Jesus died and rose again to give us this relationship with God. The righteousness that we um, have been given to us, we can't earn, but it's just a gift from Jesus who earned it for us. But then, once we are given that, re- that relationship, once we are given that righteousness, there are ways to live in righteousness. There are ways to live in a right relationship with God. Just like the, the Israelites had a covenant relationship that they um, agreed to, we step into a relationship with God, agreeing to follow Jesus in righteousness. So, uh, we need to view the Bible's instructions on how to live, not as demanding and oppressive and constraining, but freeing and a gift from God. You know, the God of the universe wants to have a relationship with you. And he wants to walk with you and show you how to be fully human, how to live, how you were created to live. And the Bible is showing you how. It's not an oppressive list of do's and don'ts. It's a gift and the way to, be, to fully live, to a fully fulfilled life. The more you know, righteous you are, the more you are in right relationship with God, with Jesus. Okay, that's what it can mean. The, the deeper that relationship is, um, you know, the closer you are to Jesus, and that's what will satisfy you in your life. And, okay, if you are, if you are like, kind of put off by a, a relationship with God, having, you know, rules or a certain way to be righteous, righteous to be in right relationship, um, I just think that we can think about relationships, like, in a way that all of them kind of have rules, in a sense. It's not just a relationship with God that has rules. Every relationship has, has rules. There are expectations, you know, things you can do that grow a relationship deeper and things you can do that damage that relationship. Like, there are, you know, quote-unquote rules to being my friend. If you are a jerk, if you're mean to me, we're, we're just not going to be friends. It's just not going to work. If, uh, if you can never hang out and I never see you, um, I'll probably, we'll probably just grow apart and then eventually we'll be like, oh, I guess, guess we're not friends anymore. You know, it damages a relationship. Um, there, are, there are things you can do that either build a relationship or damage one. And there are things that make uh, a relationship, you know, better, that strengthen a friendship. For me, it'd be just hanging out together, buying me food, listening, <laughs> listening to me talk about movies, telling me that I'm the funniest person you know. These are all good things to, for a relationship. Uh, uh, couples massages, you know, g- normal guy stuff like that. <laughs> I, I haven't done that. <laughs> um, I did have a friend that did that by accident. I think it was him and his brother-in-law on like a business trip and, and he called the spa. Yeah, can I have a couple massages? Or can I book a couple massages? A uh, couple's massage? Yeah, he wasn't paying her attention. <laughs> um, so they got a lot closer. Maybe it is good for a relationship. I don't know. I don't know, guys. Just saying. Anyway, every relationship has rules. There are different things you do uh, need to do to strengthen a relationship with a girlfriend or a boyfriend or a spouse or your kids. And so it, is only, it only makes sense that there are certain ways to follow that are strengthen our relationship with Jesus. And I'm sure for some of you, you wish there was, you know, a Bible for, how to, for the, all the rules that your spouse wants. Some of them are unwritten. But God, everything is laid out for you. How to live in that righteousness is in the Bible. And we're told how to draw, how to draw closer to Jesus. You know, and, and the, yeah, there's rules that, that can damage or build a relationship. So for, for us, if we sin against God, that's going to damage the relationship a little bit. You know, God is, is, is so forgiving, and he completely, completely will forgive you if you sin and if you mess up. But still, that sin will separate you a little bit from God. And you'll need to build that relationship back up. And if that sin becomes a pattern, you will be consistently drawn further and further away from Jesus. And maybe completely away. But, like I said earlier, our righteousness only comes from Jesus. It only comes when we enter into the kingdom of heaven. Okay, so here is where the talk of heaven comes into play with righteousness. With a relationship to Jesus, heaven and earth collide. God's spiritual realm is now a part of us when you accept Jesus. 
It's in our physical bodies, in our minds, and in our hearts. Like in the Old Testament, you know, the temple is where God would reside on earth and where the Israelites could, could meet with God in a way. You know, that is where heaven and earth overlapped for them. But now after death, after the death and resurrection of Jesus, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 3.16, don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in your midst? So now we are God's temple. Heaven now dwells within us, and, our, and within our midst, his spirit lives in us, which is just a, a wild thing to say, really, when you think about it. And so we are taking heaven wherever we go, to our families, to our jobs, in school. We are to live out what it means to be a member of the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God. So now that you are part of, of this kingdom of heaven, God wants to use you to advance this kingdom and to bring more people into this kingdom um, and more of heaven to earth, to your life, to your family, to the world around you. Okay, and, and you can do that by living righteously, by learning how to live in right relationship to Jesus. As your relationship with him grows stronger, you become more like Jesus who himself brought heaven to people, who himself was the image of God who brought heaven to earth. So this, there, there is this em, uh, like amazing call in being called to righteousness that isn't just about not doing bad things, and it's definitely not about being like holier than thou. It sounds like this, you know, kind of such a churchy word that righteous, do I really want to be that? Like, it sounds like I won't have any fun. But no, it's just about drawing closer to God and being more like him and being more like Jesus who was just loving and cared about people and took care of them and just did everything to bring heaven to earth. So we must learn how to live in right relationship to Jesus. So we should be reading God's word more and more. You know, read the books of Jesus' life, the Gospels, and learn from him. He was the greatest teacher of all time, so just learn from him. Listen to his teaching. Grow in prayer and in your time with God alone, and grow in community which we are doing now, uh, and focus on just loving Jesus more each and every day. And he will change who you are through that. And yeah, this, this is just so cool. Like, we should be excited about this. Jesus has called you to bring heaven to this world. What an amazing call on our lives. Now, God in no way, like, needs us in a sense, but he has always chosen to partner with humanity. So it's through each of us that God wants to bring heaven to earth. So it's a great privilege and a great call on our lives. Now, one last thing before I close uh, that I didn't have time to dive into, and I really wish I did, but I kind of touched on it earlier, and it'll just be quick at the end. I said that righteousness in the original language is uh, tied to God's justice. So if it's like talking about God's righteousness, it's, it's also sort of talking about like his justice and uh, his justice for the world. So um, theologian, theologians support the idea that because these two words are, are tied together, uh, with our righteousness, a desire for God's justice should be tied in with that, should also grow. You know, if, if, if we have our own righteousness and relation, right relation to God, then that, out of that will flow out to having a right relationship with others and our world. And then what should grow in that is we should want to see God's justice being brought to our world in the same way that Jesus wanted to, and Jesus did bring justice to the people around him. Not like punishment justice, because that is up to God, but loving justice, justice that creates equality, justice that brings people who are oppressed on equal footing, justice that looks after the poor and the orphans and the widows and the marginalized and these people that need God. Again, when we are in right relationship with Jesus, when we are living in righteousness, we are taking heaven with us. And the world needs heaven. It needs God. So I just want to encourage you, if there's a way that is on your heart or that comes to your mind that God is asking you to bring heaven to the world, to bring justice to someone and fight injustice, let's take action. Things like sponsoring a child or giving money to organizations that fight 
sex trafficking and child trafficking, which is still a huge issue in our world and in our country. Or getting involved in, in organizations that help the poor and the oppressed and the marginalized, even like adopting a child. Like I'd love to see churches kind of just take up this initiative. I just, Jesus calls us to take care of the orphans and there's still 40, uh, 45,000 orphans in Canada, 150 million around the world. There are kids that need heaven on earth that need justice and righteousness. There are so many good causes that the church and, and I mean the body of Christ, the people, should be, should be backing and should be excited about. And um, we should be at the forefront of this fight for God's justice to move across the world. Now, of course, you can't ignore prayer, and I'm not discounting prayer. Uh, that, that always has to be our first priority. But again, that's another sermon. Prayer is, is part of loving God and, and growing in righteousness, and that comes first. But then we're also called to action as a church because that is what Jesus did. We we're followers of Jesus. And he went to the orphans and to the widows and to the lost and the sick and the needy and the outcasts. That's who he went to. And that's who he says are first in the kingdom of heaven. And the church should do the same, and I hope we will, as we see heaven changing our world. Uh, let me just pray pray for us today. Jesus, thank you that you have given us this righteousness, this gift of righteousness. Thank you that you've given us this opportunity to live for you and to live in this kingdom of heaven, where heaven is overlapping with earth. Let us just feel your presence in that. And we just want to walk in that. And Lord, we want to help. Lord, we ask that you help us bring heaven to other people, that you help us, one, to be in right relationship with you, and then also after that, that we are in right relationship with others, that we love others, and that we love our neighbors and our world. And God, we know that our world needs you so badly. People need physical needs met, but people also need spiritual needs met even more. So God, help us meet those needs. Help us to reach the lost and help us to help those who are broken and hurting and just need you and need your justice. People that need your love and the good news of Jesus. So God, we pray that um, you do that work in our church, in Eaglemont, in, in each of us who are here today and watching online. We just pray that you'll fill, up, fill us up with this passion for righteousness, passion for you, passion to see heaven in our world. And we just pray that we will be hungry and thirsty for it. And God, we just pray that we'll devote our lives to something that is so much greater than ourselves. And I just pray that you will be with all of us as we go. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Brennan. Um, as we close today, we're just going to take a few moments um, and spend time in communion. So if you're at home, make sure that you have something that you can do for communion. If you're in person and you haven't grabbed one, they're just at the back corner. But we're just going to take a few moments um, and take these emblems together. This isn't something that we do because uh, we have to. This isn't something we do because it's a ritual. This is something we do because we want to. This is something we do because we know that we are flawed people. And we know that the cross gave us the ultimate forgiveness. So when we take these emblems, we do them in remembrance. We do them to proclaim that Jesus has saved us and that we have the ability to have an eternal life with him. So as we begin, um, you can open the crackers. They take a little bit longer with the multiple ways to open them. But I'm just going to read from the Bible, and then we're going to take these together. Uh, reading from 1 Corinthians 11, it says, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took the bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So today, that's what we're going to do. Um, I'm just going to give you guys a few moments um, whether at home or in person, to take this on your own time and to thank God for what he did on the cross. So the bread symbolizes his body. It symbolizes the fact that he was beaten and abused and had to die on the cross for what was our punishment. 
And then the blood is a symbol of the new covenant that he gave us, meaning that we can go to him for forgiveness and be completely washed clean. And that we are allowed to have a right standing with him. We are allowed to be in his presence because of what he did. So as Tanya plays, um, we're just going to take a few moments to just spend some time in your heart. Spend some time praying and thinking about what this means. If you've never done communion, if this is something totally new, I encourage you to ask questions. I encourage you to seek out what this means because this isn't something we do as a ritual. This is something we do because it's important. So I strongly encourage you, if this is something new, take some time to research it and figure out why we do it. But I'm just going to pause for a few minutes for us to have a thankful heart as we take it and then we'll take these together. So God, today we just thank you. We thank you for what you did on the cross. We thank you that we were worth it to you, that you gave everything for us and us alone. So God, today as we take this bread together, we thank you for what you did. Thank you for coming to earth and giving up your standing as God, but coming as fully man. So God, today as we take this bread together, we do it in remembrance of what you've done for us. God, today as we take this cup, we thank you. We thank you that you have offered us total forgiveness and a lifetime with you, that you guide us, that you love us, and that you are continually there for us. So God, as we take that together, we do it in remembrance of you. Jesus, it is an honor that we get to do this. It is an honor that we get to remember you. So we thank you for these moments. We thank you that we can do it as a body. And we thank you for what you have done. In your holy, incredible name, Lord God. Amen. Thank you. Well, that is our Sunday morning. Thank you guys so much for being with us online and in person. It is always so encouraging and special to get to spend time uh, together as a community. So please take some time after service. Connect with one another. Um, Pastor Marlowe's not here, so I feel like I should give his usual speech. Meet someone you don't know. And if you have met them and you don't remember, you can say, it's okay, I don't, just didn't remember you, or something like that. <laughs> you can find me and correct me if I'm wrong, but something like that. So enjoy your Sunday and have a great one. <laughs>